There's an expectant silence, so I'm going to fill it. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to those who are joining us online, and welcome to uh, this workshop organized by the DNS Research Federation entitled The Internet in 20 Years' Time. Uh, so this, the, this is organized around the theme of avoiding fragmentation. And what we decided to do was to imagine ourselves into a future in 2043, and we will be reflecting on the internet as, as it has become in our prediction, how we got there, what good would look like in 2043, and how we, what action we might need to take now to fulfill the hoped for future that we want. Um, so my name is Emily Taylor. I'm a founder of the DNS Research Federation. Um, I'm also a CEO of Oxford Information Labs and an associate fellow at the international affairs think tank Chatham House. Um, I'm joined today uh, by a wonderful panel of experts who are going to um, indulge this, um, this act of imagination, but I also hope that we can involve you, the audience in the room, and also online. Uh, please feel free to ask for the floor at any stage. We, we're not doing the sort of opening remarks. We're going to just travel through those themes of imagining the future and how we got there. So at a, if at any point you would like to join the conversation, please, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, so I'm joined today on the panel. I'm going to kind of run through uh, um, from, from, the end, uh, from end to end. We have um, Olaf Kolkman who I think is, uh, is your current job title Principal Internet Technology Policy and Advocacy at the Internet Society? Thank you. Well, I don't know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> but we're very, very fortunate to have Olaf. Those of you who know him will know how deeply his, uh, his understanding and communication of the technical layers of the internet and his his ability to communicate that to non-technical people is much appreciated on this panel, and, and I hope we'll be hearing that and the, and the reach across into standards as well. We have um, Lorraine Porchonkula, who's the um, executive director of the Datasphere Initiative, and I hope I haven't tr <laughs> pronounced your name <laughs> completely wrongly. Um, we have um, Ambassador Henri Verdier, uh, from France, uh, uh, who is joining us today as well. We're very uh, delighted to welcome you to the panel, Ambassador. We have, a, um, you'll see uh, an empty seat behind me, uh, beside me. That is for uh, Raoul Echeverria, who's joining us at, at about the hour mark. Um, he's the Executive Director of the Latin American Internet Association. We then have um, Izumi Aizu, a senior research fellow at the Institute for Info Socionomics at the, uh, something, like that. something like that. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. uh, at Tama University here in Japan. And, uh, and then uh, Shital Kumar, um, who's head of advocacy at Global Partners Digital. So welcome to all of you on the panel. So my first question to, to you all is, if we imagine ourselves in 2043, um, what does the internet look like? Uh, let's, let's try the sort of, you know, your best guess. And, uh, you know, before we get started on that, um, as we're in your hands predict as futurologists today, how good are you at predicting the future, um, would you say? Does anybody want to share any, um, any anecdotes about their... Their prowess at predicting the future, Olaf. Have you got anything for us? I, I knew this was coming. I, I told this story to Emily once. Um, in the second half of the 90s, sort of 95, 96 or so, I was uh, making web pages in the university, studying astronomy. And at some point, uh, a, a PhD student that I was working with came to me and said, "Let's bail out. Let's start a company making web pages." And I, I told him in his face. 
no, I will not do this. This whole web thing will not go beyond academic libraries and preprints. <laughs> so that is how good I am at predicting the future. Well, great to have you on this uh, future gazing panel, Olaf. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Shital, have you got anything for us? Oh, I'm not sure if I have um, a mic here. Sorry. We might have to share. Um, so I think the danger with this, uh, these questions is it also forces you to reveal your age to some extent, um, which is uh, <laughs> uh, part of the game perhaps. But I do, um, I do remember perhaps, it's not me, but I remember my, my parents um, saying um, that they, well, one of them, um, that they imagined 20 years ago that in 20 years we would... Um, have cameras on us all the time, um, which is true. We have our phones, um, and we would be able to access, you know, what we want to see on um, on smaller phones because they kind of imagine that the the the, the devices, um, the pagers, and then the big block phones that we had, and um, we were carrying around, would just become smaller and smaller and faster and faster. So that happened. Um, <laughs> they actually should be, <laughs> they on, should the be on this panel. Um, <laughs> but I think that that um, lends us to you know the question of like how does that then evolve and what does the internet look like? I think it's more perhaps a question for people: what does the internet feel like? Um, and it's, I think, um, going to be along the lines of, um, of course, what we create and what we, we envision and how we build that. Um, but, but an internet that is more, just more in our lives, more embedded, more difficult to, to disassociate from, from everything um, that we, we, we live in and inhabit. So, um, so that, that would was be the my prediction. <laughs> and we'll, we'll come back to the vision of the future in, in, in a second, Chital. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Ambassador Verdier, I think if we do that one. Hello, and thank you for the invitation. I started my first internet company in 1995 in France. Oh. So we were 15,000 web surfers. <laughs> And I didn't miss internet. So here, I was right. And I remember when, for example, uh, do you remember when Bill Gates said that internet would never work and Microsoft.net will be better? So here, I didn't miss uh, the story. But I, I, my company was a subsidiary of a publisher. And I remember the, the birth of Wikipedia. And I thought and I said uh, that it was impossible to conceive an encyclopedia without a, a genius like Diderot or d'Alembert. So I say, this, this is impossible. And that was my first mistake in, <laughs> in this story. <laughs> yeah, well, it, you know, it, what do they say? Uh, predictions are difficult, especially about the future, right? But you, you, got, you got a lot of it right, like mm -hmm. Chital's parents. So, but Izumi, how about you? Thank you. I think many of you know the very famous term, the best way to predict the future is to invent it by Alan Kay. But, 12 years ago, there was a big earthquake and tsunami happened. We have never predicted, right? And we didn't want to invent it, right, either, at all. If it's positive, you can invent, you can make the future bright. But what, how many of us have imagined that Gaza thing just started to fire and what's gonna happen? How many of you, Ukraine, not to mention, but also 28 years ago, there's a big earthquake in Kyoto. I mean, Kobe hit us, many killed. So yes, while we are very much optimistic about the future with all the te great things like technology, internet, smartphone, AI, the reality may be composed by many different colors, dark, void, vacuum, green, and white. So I don't know how really to uh, respond to your nice question, Emily, but I will try to come up later. Uh, thank you very much. Lorraine? Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you for the invitation of this panel. Um, I keep thinking that, well, I grew up with the internet, right? It was very, it's hard for you to predict something that it was part of the air, something that's already a given, right? Um, and so I remember when I was 
very young, and my father had one of uh, had a local ISP in Brazil. It was one of the first in in Brasilia, actually, and uh, and I remember playing around the servers and the cool rooms and all that. That was very much part of sort of my life, right? I've been part of that. And so trying to retrace when I started thinking about the internet as something separate um, was probably when I was around my undergrad studying international relations and economics, and I was very much into Amartya Sen and as a Nobel Prize winner thinking about capabilities and, and how that is, that is uh, development, right? Rather than just thinking about how much money you're going to make or GDP you're going to grow in a country, it's about capabilities of individuals or communities. And, and it struck to me, uh, particularly because that was around uh, where, well, the, uh, uh, the, the green wave and the movements in the Middle East were happening, there was the Arab Spring. And I remember the sense of excitement of what technology was going to bring and the kind of empowerment and expansion of capabilities was going to bring. And this realization very naively at the point, and I think it was shared by many people, that there was no way to fight this because it was, because it was going to come in terms of liberating uh, people and populations and technology was going to empower everyone. And it was interesting because I did do a small survey asking people about their predictions and there were a number of questions, uh, answers uh, to that question. Uh, and, and a lot of people saying, well, there's just a lot of positivity and optimism in terms of what it was going to bring right, to society. So when I, when I think back to, to, to that, I think, well, Maybe, I mean, I'm certainly not there in terms of just uh, being the solution to so many of the problems that we already have inherently as societies, uh, but, but somehow it has brought good things. So the answer is way more nuanced, uh, as with any prediction. Uh, it, it never comes in an in a extremist kind of scenario. Yeah, so we're not going to get it right, but I think that, you know, that... that that view from you, Lorraine, as somebody who, who never remembers not having the internet, um, that, that you know, the, the future is difficult to predict. It will, be, it will have good and bad aspects, as Izumi has said. But it's also, you know, one of the things I hope we can rediscover on this panel in a small way is that sense of optimism that you describe from your earlier time. Um, and um, so... We, we set out in an accompanying paper to this session three possible scenarios for the future, um, which we've published on our blog. I, I don't know if you've seen it. I think it's on the, on the page uh, for this workshop. But in, uh, in the sort of TLDR um, aspect, it's we muddle along more or less as we're going, and it's a little bit worse probably, you know, but somehow all holds together somehow. Um, a bit like what we've got today, but in 20 years' time. There's a fully fragmented uh, future, which is either divided at the technical layers, at ideological layers, at, um, at regulatory layers, or all three. And then there is the bright future, the where we all collectively get our act together and uh, almost sort of deliberately work to create the internet in that optimistic frame that you described so beautifully, uh, Lorraine. So if I could just get a sense from our panel, and, and also please do you know, raise your hand if you would like to, to, to join in this conversation. I'd like to hear from you, you know, according to your expertise or your area of interest, you don't have to cover everything, what do you think is the most likely future? that we will have for the internet and why? And at which layer do you see the most risk? Um, shall I start with you, Olaf, um, as you started by sharing so honestly your prediction about there being no future? Yeah, um, I, I, again, uh, predicting the future is incredibly hard. Um, um, and what you, you normally do with scenario uh, uh, thinking is you go into the extremes. Now, when I read this paper for the first time, uh, what, I, what I sort of noticed um, is that the future is already here. What you've taken uh, uh, are points uh, that we already see start happening, to, to starting happening, and that can explode and find their, find their way into that future and become more prevalent. 
Um, and if that happens, uh, 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 the, the world will look different. Um, when I was thinking of the, the story of hope, um, the, and this is a way to, to sort of classify those futures. Um, when I was young, uh, again, uh, what I liked the, about the internet, what drove me towards the internet, and what made me the, the, the professional that I am now, is the openness. The openness, the, the, uh, really the scientific method of sharing knowledge, criticize each other, uh, having knowledge available. Everything I learned about the internet, I learned on the internet. And I shared my learnings and I contributed to that internet as well. And that, that feature of openness, I think, is, is one that uh, uh, sort of classifies is, is another way to classify the scenarios that you have. Uh, a scenario, that first scenario that you have, a mixed scenario with a, uh, a, a net, a closed networks or mixed networks coexisting with the, inter, uh, uh, the traditional internet, is about being closed, about being proprietary, about um, developing services um, for which the services make the money and uh, uh, people pay for the services and that's the way that they connect. I connect to this service and the network connectivity itself is not important anymore. And that's different from the, the third evolution which is more open and treats the internet as a way to connect to the rest of the world and choose your services. I, so I, I leave it at this for the moment we can go in deeper. Thank you. Um, I've got three people waiting to join the conversation, and I'm so pleased to see that at such an early phase. And also, I would encourage any women in the room who would like to ask a question <laughs> to <laughs> either raise their hands. I, I personally find the, the mic in the, in the aisle quite a big step, uh, but if any, if any women would like to join the conversation from the floor, please do. And but some younger people. Uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you. But let's. Can we just run through some some very brief injections from you uh, to the conversation, if you're ready to do so? Thank you very much. Sure. This and is Barry Lieber. Um, what I'm going to say is going to follow on very nicely from what Olaf just said. Um, <clears throat> I have a talk that I've given in a few places uh, about internet architecture, um, how we built the internet, we collectively, uh, how we uh, how it got where it where it is and where it's going. And in the, how it got where it is, there's a, a lot of, uh, where, what are the innovations that drove the architecture? Um, and, and how did we add to the protocols, the suite of protocols that make up the internet with things like media streaming and um, teleconferencing that we're working, we're now working on protocols for autonomous cars to talk to each other in a little pocket that, um, so there's, the where we're going is a, a realization that the, that what has, Driven the internet is innovation in in use cases and applications, and the things that we w that we can do with the internet have built up the the suite of protocols and the technology that makes the internet. So as we look for the future, where it's going, it's going to be. I, I can't predict specifics, but what I can predict is that it's going to be some brilliant engineer who's a third my age who has the next great idea for an application on the internet that's going to drive another set of, um, of standards and technology that builds the internet 20 years from now. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for also highlighting the role of standards in shaping the way that we experience technology. So I hope that we'll come back to that on the panel. Um, Andrew, do you want to just give us a quick injection from you? And then um, after we've heard uh, from Mike, I'm going to resume our panel discussion with Izumi. Th this might actually work quite well. It um, follows quite nicely I think, on sort of Barry's point. So I'm going to come at it from a different point of view. I think when we look back in 20 years, we're probably at or close to an inflection point. Up until now, the internet's largely been a force for good. Uh, and I would observe that when we consider things like um, surveillance, capitalism, malware, disinformation and misinformation and uh, CSAM, we're at the point where the balance is shifting to it no longer being a force for good um, and actually being a force for harm rather than good. 
when you net out the various effects. Um, if I look at, so this is where it gets to Barry's point, those sort of standards sort of bodies, I, uh, I literally this morning received an email telling me that the, uh, from a survey of the uh, IETF membership, uh, it's around 10% female. I'll leave that out without comment. Um, there are no end users or virtually no end users uh, present in the standards bodies. Uh, the, uh, the, the ITF's not unusual um, uh, in, in that regard. Um, none of them are really very good in terms of multi-stakeholderism in any meaningful way. So I would suggest that when we look back in 20 years, I think the reason it's an inflection point is we either change the SDOs to be multi-stakeholder and diverse in all sorts of different axes, or uh, potentially this will fail under the weight of the harms, uh, because we need to design this as a internet for the users, not by the engineers. Uh, Thank you. So we've got two very contrasting views already for the future. We've got uh, uh, from Barry, the idea that you know there's going to be some really unexpected piece of in innovation that just comes out of nowhere, and that sort of picks up a point from Izumi about you know when you look back at things we failed to to predict even in the last week, these are unexpected things, and a, a somewhat uh, more pessimistic view from uh, from Andrew about you know uh, and highlighting some 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 aspects, if, if you like, of the standards development world uh, that are not currently as inclusive um, as they should be, and even the internet becoming a, a force for harm rather than good, which I saw, you know, caused ripples in the room. Mike, can you help us out with another vision, and then we'll resume the panel. Well, my comments are going to feed in very nicely to both <laughs> previous speakers. Uh, I'm at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, but I've had eight dream jobs. A couple back, well, I was at um, Georgetown teaching about communications, culture, and technology. My most popular class was called How to Predict the Futures, parentheses S. And um, I taught the students that the best way to understand what's coming isn't to look at what the technology can do, it's to look at, and not to look at what governments think the technology should not do. The best thing to do is to look at what individual users will want the technology to do. And that's whether it's digital technology, whether it's biotech, whether it's cars. And I don't think your panel is structured in a way to do that. So I want to rewrite your project description, your, your program description, to spend at least a few minutes thinking about what is it that are driving the companies and the governments to make the internet better. Because I'm a technological optimist and a political pessimist. In those countries that have policy that allow a lot of innovation and competition, I think we're going to solve most of the problems that were just mentioned. But Thank you. I don't think we're going to understand the future if we don't understand what's driving it. And I'm just challenging you to but ask that's that that's question. A, that's a really welcome challenge. And, and I think, Izumi, I'd like to, to turn to you on that. You know, we, we often talk about fragmentation in very particular ways, like we're, going, we're in the layers, we're talking about it at a technical level. But as Mike has, has challenged us, you know, there are lots of different ways that fragmentation might emerge. And there's different ways of framing the issue as well. So I, okay, thank really you very much, um, Professor Nelson. Um, <laughs> I'm a student of your class, okay, 20 years ago. <laughs> well, it's a pity that we don't have anybody in the teens and 20s on the panel, not to mention that many in the room. I had an interesting discussion yesterday with the 12 years old kid and five and talked about the war and peace and the internet. But let's aside, put aside. Uh, with the scenario, uh, you prepared three ones, right? A mixed networks coexisting with the traditional internet. And the second scenario is fragmented internet with national or block politics internet. And the third one is the globally unified strength internet. I would say our uh, first one and two mix, and I would call it chaos. I don't see any globally uh, coherent strength internet. 
I asked Mr. GPT and Mr. Bard a few minutes ago. <laughs> I got more than I can read <laughs> in five minutes. Uh, but it, interestingly, overall nature of the internet, while fragmentation due to political and economic reasons might be prominent, the underlying effort, ethos of the internet is, uh, uh, as a tool uh, for global communication knowledge, shall uh, likely persist. That's Mr. GPT. And Mr. Bard said, personally, I believe that the internet is likely to become more unified in the coming years. Very rosy ro pictures. And these are AI, not me. So, um, I would perhaps later explain a little bit why I, I would call it chaos. As Mike may uh, have already mentioned, but you said for the better internet, I challenge that. I would say for better society, better people, not internet. That's a very different views of the world and the internet. So that's my second um, contribution. Thank you very much, Izumi. And, and I think it sort of comes back to where you started us, uh, Lorraine, is the, the uh, and, and Chital, the sort of, maybe it's, it's more and more um, uh, false to, to think of technology as something that is separate from ourselves, that it's, it's integrated, that the future of the technology is very much about our own future as societies and as people. Uh, Lorraine, uh, what do you think is the most likely of any scenarios, but the three may have helped or not, but uh, uh, you know, we want to remember Mike's um, challenge on that. You, know, you can just frame it however you want. It's on. Uh, thank you so much. I actually, I really love the flow of the conversation and how organically we're integrating the different arguments. So I'm going to try to build on all of that. Um, I, I think that the question around fragmentation needs to be, you know, needs to take a step back in terms of in, in which layer are we talking about when we're talking about fragmentation. Often people tend to confuse the issues in terms of uh, where it's actually, what kind of fragmentation we're talking about. Um, and also, uh, I mean, there's a difference between fragmentation on the technical layer and a fragmentation on the legal and regulatory layer. And so, uh, for me, it's more useful to think about, I mean, if I'm talking about scenarios uh, in 20 years, I don't think we're going to have such a big issue with the technical layer in itself. I think the real big hairy challenge will go in, is going to be around the legal and regulatory space. And that's not a potential if. It's a reality right now. And so I'd rather focus on that scenario, which is very much true around fragmentation around and, and, and regulatory uh, aspects, than on what could happen if uh, a number of things happen in the domain name uh, system, et cetera, right? Um, so that taken aside, I also think that uh, ultimately, uh, it's not only about fragmentation of the internet, uh, as Izumi said, it's, it's about what's happening with our digital society. And so it's uh, the question that uh, I'd like to pose then with the, with the also uh, um, instigated by, uh, by Mike is what a, how, do we, how are we going to do to get along uh, really? And, uh, and what are the incentives? Because ultimately uh, um, policymakers are going to design regulatory and legal, res legal responses to what they are afraid of, to what they want to control. And talking to, to Mike just before the panel, he was saying he wrote a paper just uh, 25 years ago around what are the different uh, incentives of, of, of what governments would like to control, which is basically taxes, uh, uh, basically you know content that is online. Uh, how do you actually uh, uh, ensure uh, national security? Uh, democratic processes, all of these are incentives in terms of uh, how, how, how do you build the tools from a national angle to, uh, and see them uh, reflected in the technologies that we have today. So the questions are around how the national concerns are going to, are going to be um, uh, really uh, then reflected in that technology and the fragmentation happens in that, uh, in that angle, really, which is legal, regulatory, and about how do we actually find convergence or how do we find, find interoperability uh, around those different uh, spaces of legal and regulatory regimes and how do we find the institutions and the processes that are able to, to take this all in from a more 
agile perspective from a way that coordinates across mm. borders and across multiple stakeholders. Thank you very much. So I, I hope we can expand on your final point about, you know, what do we need to do? How do we equip ourselves from the future for the future we want? But we've, we've heard from, from the audience and the panel uh, that there, there might be fragmentation risks at a technical level and also from you from a legal and regulatory level. Uh, Ambassador Verdier, I'd like to, to turn to you now for your prediction about where we are likely to end up. And thank you very much. I can see already five people, including two women. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to, I'm going to go to Ambassador Verdier and then to Chatel to articulate your predicted or preferred visions. Um, and, um, and then I'd like to hear about your visions as well for the future. And we can, we can join forces in that way. Okay, I will try to be brief and make four small remarks. First, I don't know what will happen, but I know what we should fight for. Because you, you say that you don't remember the world before Internet, uh, I can imagine the world without Internet and the world after Internet. And I'm not sure that my daughters will know the world where we are living in today. Because, of course, probably there will always be a technical uh, standards <laughs> and uh, the possibility to, to build uh, interaction between computers. But you all know that um, some big states don't really like this free, open, decentralized uh, internet. And some and most big tech don't care about it. And you did observe, like me, that, for example, now 80% of the submarine cables wow. are private. And we, we can observe a tendency of um, privatization of, of something that was a common. And that's, so there will always be an, an internet, like there is a dark net, for example, but maybe we won't live within this internet. And that's the main concern. So I wanted to share this with you, and we have to fight for uh, this, again, open, neutral, free, uh, decentralized internet based on the open standards that we can share. My second and quite, uh, so maybe that's normal. I remember the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. Most of you remember John Perry Barlow. At this time, the cyberspace could be seen as a foreign place, somewhere else. Now, it did invade and transform everything. Education, health, business, war, peace. So this is the normal life. There is not anymore a digital life. This is a life. <laughs> so every problems we have as governments and as citizens, as democracies, are uh, as a, a digital aspect. That's why you will observe more and more digital diplomats, because now half of the diplomacy depends on the digital revolution. So we have to think about this. And this is new. Six years ago, you didn't have any digital diplomats. Now we quite all have digital diplomats. Uh, so we'll have to, to, to engage everything we did conceive as states, as democracies, for centuries. And just to finish and to launch the conversation, I share your view that we should pay attention. We should separate the, the, the possibility of a technical fragmentation, which would be a very, very bad scenario. Uh, I don't know if you did think about the fact that so far we are all interdependent. Even the, the, the less digitalized countries, they rely on the, the internet, the same as we do. If you could imagine uh, two or three technical internet, the temptation to disconnect the other <laughs> would be very high. And the war will become a war about the, the, the ground infrastructure itself. So, so far, we, are, we have cyber war, we have uh, attacks, we, we do observe a lot of things, but no one did intend to disconnect internet itself, because it will hurts even the attacker. Uh, so there is a technical layer and there is a political layer, the legal layer. From my perspective, I, I will fight always for the unique, open, neutral, decentralized internet. The, the legal aspect is something different. So of course it would be better for the business, for everything to, to converge in one direction. But if you believe in democracy, you believe in the right of the people to take decisions regarding his own future. So we cannot 
ask for uh, one legal framework for all the world, because we won't agree with some countries. In France, you cannot say publicly uh, anti-Semitic or homophobic words, because the French people want this. So we don't have to comply with other regulation if, if we want this as a democratic uh, country. And here we, okay, I will make a, a word and I finish with this. I will fight for one unique internet. I, I'm not there to build one unique market for Mr. Zuckerberg. That's another issue. That's not mine. Thank you very much. And uh, I found that very moving, actually, thinking about, you know, of the same generation who remember not having an internet and thinking to our children's future and that that, that might be the same, more similar to our past than, than we would like. Um, but um, thank you for, for, you know, policy people do like to be miserable and to have, to have uh, you articulating so strongly the, the intention to, to really fight for a better future is something that we often, we feel very passive sometimes with technology, that it, it happens to us and we don't get to design our future. And uh, from the panel, I'd like to hear um, last but not least from you, Chital, about you know, what scenario you think is either most likely or, or what you would like to see. Well, quickly, as I would love to hear from everyone else, um, I can only speak to what I would like to see um, because I think we build we build and we do design our, our future. Unfortunately, some of us, of course, don't have as much power to do so as others, and that's something we have to, to be aware of, and I think where we, the internet should, should act as a tool for, for changing that. But going back to my point of, instead of thinking about how the internet might look like, how it should feel, it should feel, in 20 years' time, liberating. And it should feel liberating to people who perhaps now don't occupy those positions of power and don't have them. Um, and, and that, I think, is an, is an opportunity for us to, to ensure that um, the internet now doesn't, or in the future, doesn't reflect the inequalities um, uh, of our society and, and the structures of them. And uh, to a point that was made earlier, what's really important in that is ensuring that those who build the, um, the technologies, build the standards, um, are engaging with each other and opening up these spaces uh, to all those affected. And I know we're going to come on to what can we do, what should we do. I think a lot of thinking has been done both here within the Internet Governance Forum and outside about that. So really happy to reflect on that because I think there's a lot of positive uh, recommendations and concrete recommendations. I think we also, frankly, we know what we need to do, um, but we often don't do it. So the more we uh, enumerate, I think, and the more we vocalize and the more we commit collectively to what we need to do, the better. So I'm glad we're here to do that. Um, and yeah, happy to pick up on the points of what we need to do to get to that third scenario. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Chital, and that really tees us up very nicely for the next stage in our conversation. Uh, I'd like to hit, thank you very much for waiting patiently. Um, I, I'm going to go to Georgia first, and then I'm going to come to, to, to you, Steve, uh, and then we'll sort of zigzag across our, 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 our audience members. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the panel for all your comments. Um, my name is Georgia Osborne. I'm Senior Research Analyst at the DNS Research Federation. Um, so you mentioned incentives, and I think one thing I think about when I think about the internet in 20 years' times are what are the incentives? Um, money is a massive incentive. Uh, we hear a lot about what people are talking about with Web3, crypto, um, and those kind of different fragmentations that you have on a technical layer. Um, and I would say that money is currently driving the incentive to build a Web3 through crypto, and perhaps this future will be much more com uh, complex with that coming into play. Um, and perhaps it will be more than money that will drive that incentive as the technology develops. I was wondering wh whether the panel could comment on this type of fragmentation. So you have the Ukraine war, which is funded mainly by crypto, 
Um, and you know, you can call it the metaverse, the fediverse, or whatever you want to call it, but I'd be curious to know what type of fragmentation you might see in that kind of area, whether you see it being integrated or more fragmented. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to, to take the comments and then we, c we can invite the panel to, to make some comments or reactions to, to that challenge on, on Web3 and, and crypto. Thank you very much for your question, Steve. Thank you, Steve Del Bianco with NetChoice. And uh, fragmentation by regulation is not only the largest risk, but it is the reality, as you indicated. So for the short term, for the front end of the next 20 years, that is what we'll confront. There are scarcely any inhibitions for a government to legislate in any way it wishes, in a populist fashion, particularly today, because the consequences are non-existent. The governments that try to control what their citizens see and say and contradictorily uh, impose privacy at the same time they're trying to enforce the laws against bad actors, those contradictions are not enough to stop governments from doing so. 75% of this conference has been about AI, and it really isn't about a drive to consolidate and cooperate on AI regulation. No, it's been a competition. The speakers have competed with their vision of how they believe AI should be regulated, and that will continue. Uh, in the case of net choice in the United States, we try to push back on that fragmentation through lawsuits based on unconstitutional approaches. We're having some success there, but that is not going to work in a cross-border fashion. I'm, I'm calling on business and civil society, particularly the engineering sector, to begin to document the consequences of fragmentation regulation at all the layers, document not only the costs, because costs become a barrier to entry, and costs become costs that are passed on to the consumers, the voters of the countries that have embraced unilateral action by their governments. So I believe we need to raise the pain level so that governments believe that there's some cost to enacting unique legislation that imposes cross-border jurisdictional impacts and raises the cost of everything we're trying to do. Thank you very much. And I think that um, I want to hear from everyone that this is, I knew this would happen, but it's, it's great to have such a, uh, 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 an interactive conversation, but I, uh, I want to come to you, Ambassador Verdier, on that point, and uh, any others uh, that want to join in. But how do we maintain what you were talking about, which is democratic choice and that diversity, while also maintaining the unity? So let's hold that thought and and hear from the others from the audience. Thank you very much, ma'am. Hi, my name is Nikki Colasso. I run uh, global public policy at Roblox, which is a metaverse company. Um, I, I think that comment was really well taken because as I've been sitting here, I've been thinking about the difference between IGF last year and IGF this year. And if for those of you that were at the conference last year or attended online, a lot of the conversation was around how we do approach technology from a, a perspective of inclusivity. So Sheetal, I really appreciate your thoughts on on inclusivity, we talked a lot about incorporating the global south into the decisions that were being made. Um, and so my question for the panel is, as we move to this third phase of the conversation, I think we understand, like at a high level, what the issues are, like very crisply, what do you see, or what are the specific steps that companies, civil societies, and others can take to engage, um, you know, users, others, in parts of the world that may not get representation and in countries that have geopolitical differences? How do we actually go about having those conversations? What is the way to do that? If we know we need to do it, that's agreed. How, how does that happen? Thank you very much for that. So that's, uh, so we, so far we've got Web3 and money, interoperable laws and involvement of Global South and those who have, who we, dis, you know, where there is disagreement on the basic ideology. Um, Sir. I was really wondering if you knew my name. That was going to be impressive. Um, hi, I'm Jarrell James, and I do have a question on similarly with regards to money. I don't really know how to predict, predict the future of the internet, but I do know how to look at history and see that money is the overwhelming factor for how power is flexed on um, certain communities. Uh, my question is with regards to both regulation um, and with regards to uh, policy around sanctionable actions. So as we see regulation for um, monopolies exist in traditional, our traditional finance system, do we see a development where we stop 
um, what's essentially digital colonization from happening from so large actors like Facebook into regions that are massively under underdeveloped in the uh, communications infrastructure infrastructure sector, and do we create and enact actual policies to prevent those communities from only taking solutions from outside of their regions instead of doing what we do, which is bring tech to these communities. How do we foster this development from within these communities so that in 20 years, we don't sit on the same problem that we have now, which is uh, you know, 21st century colonialism and resource extraction. And uh, the further part of that is just with these shutdowns, is there sanctionable actions that can start to inform this direction? Thank you very much for that. And is Jarell, right? Jarell, yeah. yeah, thank you. So, so that we've got, we're adding digital colonialism, and how do we, uh, how do we foster uh, sort of indigenous development, if you like, if I can put it that way, and also um, sanction bad actors. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Bramlett. I'm the ICT coordinator for the Counterterrorism Executive Directorate with the United Nations Security Council. Um, is the, the issue of money is very interesting. I, I was amazed by the remarks by the representative of Saudi Arabia yesterday when he was quoting the internet that we deserve and the billions of dollars that would be lost if we didn't um, solve issues of fragmentation and the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs. So I thought it was interesting that he put it right in front of us so bluntly. Um, and when you look at gaming and, and all of these other industries, multi-billion dollar industries, mobile bank, uh, gaming, regular gaming, I mean, it's, it's an amazing amount of money being generated. Amazing amount of money being generated by bad actors, which is a space that I look at, is how terrorists and violent extremists are exploiting ICT for criminal purposes. Um, one of the main areas that we're looking at is counter-narratives, and so how um, language is being proliferated across various systems uh, to recruit, to radicalize, and to you know, keep this criminal enterprise going. And that's one of the issues that we're looking at with regard to regulation is um, language across jurisdictions and what's considered harmful language, what's considered unlawful language, and how uh, authorities in various jurisdictions are going to deal with that in these you know, borderless zones for, for what's out on the internet. Also, one of the spaces that we're looking at in terms of futuristics is the concept of reality. I do remember life before the internet. <laughs> um, and yet, the, looking at the kids growing up, uh, especially those who are playing in the games and in the metaverse areas, um, we had some really good talks with Naver Zed recently. And the concept of reality, uh, of what I consider to be real, I go into a game, I play, and I leave, and then I go do my life. Whereas for other people, it's becoming less and less of a, a division. And when we're looking at legislating crimes you know, and bringing uh, crimes into domestic frameworks, we already have a problem where we don't have the legislative frameworks and the capacities in member states to be able to even deal with the internet as it is now. Many states don't have laws that say terrorism recruitment online is illegal. They have laws against terrorist recruitment, but it doesn't apply to cyberspace. Um, and, and so as we move into metaverse, fediverse type realities, what if something happens in the metaverse? You know, if you, for example, detonate the White House in a metaverse world, it could be very real to some people. How do you even deal with that? And so these are things that we're starting to think about um, from that, our side of the house. Thank you Thank very you. much, Jennifer. And that's a, a fascinating addition as well. Uh, so, you know, a huge amount to unpack in that, but the sort of the recruitment of terrorism on, uh, uh, online, the establishment of counter narratives, and also I think the key point at the end, the capacities and uh, uh, among legislative legislators, the legislative frameworks uh, in all countries. Let's have a very brief moment with Vittorio and uh, Bertrand because I feel like I'm neglecting our panel. <laughs> like I can see they're like, hang on. But, okay. but uh, I want to have a, a, sort of a reflection on what you've heard and then in the final uh, stage of our, of our workshop 
to really think about action and think about how do we really start to articulate the vision of the future we want and what we need to do now. So let's go to Be uh, Ve Vittoria and then... <laughs> Vittoria uh, Bertola. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to be, well, actually, I'll get to my, my question. Well, my, I'll make my question first, but then I want to make a comment. The question was, uh, well, don't we think that we need the regulation to preserve the, inter the interoperability, the openness? Because I think that the reason why, we, at least in Europe, we're seeing this wave of the regulation is exactly to preserve the globality and the interoperability, the openness of the Internet, and not to, to, to break it. But I, I was prompted to make a comment by the previous round of comments about the future of the Internet. Yeah, if the, the, the future of the internet is decided by what the people want from it, what do the people want from an internet? If you take the average internet users today, what do they want? I mean, they want uh, entertainment to fill up their lives, like uh, football matches, porn, or whatever. Right. And they want uh, attention. They spend their time going to Kyoto and not even looking at the places, but taking selfies and posting them to socials and saying, hey, hey, I'm here. Give me attention. I need someone to tell me I'm beautiful, interesting. And so, <laughs> well, yeah, unfortunately. So we, we've been You'll building be someone, yeah. which is <laughs> growing that the bad parts of the... Of, for most, uh, for, to most regards, uh, the worst parts of, of the internet personality of, of the, you, the people. So the, the problem is, what's the social purpose of the internet today? What, what, because we, we, have, we see the purpose in terms of new technology, we want uh, autonomous driving and whatever, AI and uh, bionic arms. Uh, and why are we doing them? Well, because we can, and because someone will make money out of it. But what's the social purpose of this? I think we're missing that. We had one 30 years ago, mm. but we don't have it now. Yeah, I, th I think there's a real thread running through a lot of the comments on incentives and what people want and mm. going back to Mike's earlier challenge about the users and, and you frame that really beautifully. Thank you very much. Uh, Bertrand. Hello, so I'm Bertrand Le Chapelle with the Data Sphere Initiative. I want to piggyback on the distinction that Lorraine introduced between uh, technical fragmentation and legal fragmentation. What is interesting is a lot of the technical fragmentation, if it happens, is not driven by a technical objective, mostly. It's driven by the political environment and the objective of preserving spaces that would become separated because they would correspond to the spaces that are politically separated today. So the fact is that the legal fragmentation is a fact of the international system because of the national sovereignty, and that's a reality that goes, as Henri was mentioning, to the notion of territorially based national sovereignties. However, to go back to what Jennifer was saying, one of the challenges that we have is that even without interoperability of the legal framework, the separation and the legal fragmentation is what prevents us from addressing the abuses in many cases. When you have a criminal investigation, the framework for access to electronic evidence is non-existent at the moment and in completely insufficient. And in most cases, it's a whack-a-mole game to avoid a certain number of contents. And so I would just want to finish by saying, I completely agree with Henri that there is the democratic capacity for each country to do what they think is best for their uh, citizens. That being said, interoperability doesn't mean alignment completely. Just like the architecture of the internet allows autonomous networks to function through protocols in an interoperable manner. I think the big challenge that we have if we want to preserve the open internet is to reduce the friction at the legal level by building a governance protocol that allows heterogeneous governance frameworks, including the governments, the companies, and all other human organizations, to be interoperable yet autonomous. Thank you very much. And of course, um, uh, Bertrand, for those who Maybe there's somebody in the room who doesn't know Bertrand, but the, the work that you've been doing um, over the last decade or more to try to promote that legal interoperability um, is, is, is very much leading in this. Thank you for, you for your question. What I'm going to do, if I may, with your permission, is come back to the, to the panel to react, and then I'm going to come back to you as first in the queue. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, so we have had seven interventions so far, um, and it's not even half past 12 yet. Um, so what I'd like to do is to go through our panel and please choose uh, one question that you would like to respond to uh, that, is, that is clearly in, in your frame of expertise um, or that just um, stimulated some thoughts. Who would like to go first? Uh, can I start with you, Ambassador Verdier? Because there was quite a lot 
on on your uh, th that was sort of building on your points or maybe challenging your points about legal on interoperability and how do we reconcile that autonomy with still being in a, ne a network? So, but I think that quite everything was said. Um, as I said, first we have to fight to protect a common infrastructure that can be interoperable. Internet is a network of, ne of network. Internet is not just one standard everywhere. And there is a second and different question of uh, legal fragmentation. I, I cherish your approach, Bertrand, that you, we should learn and try to build interoperable legislation. Uh, but so far, we don't really do this, and there is no world government. So, so I will say something more. Um, so let's try to progress in this direction, but we, we are not there. But maybe we should add one more observation uh, from my perspective. You know, I come from the very libertarian internet. I did cherish John Perry Barlow 30 years ago. So most of my friends ask me, why did you join the government? Yes. The bad actors. Betrayed them. <laughs> and why are you now fighting for regulation, and for European regulation? And I don't feel that I did change because from my perspective, that's personal. That's not the official position of the French government. Yeah. When you enter within a social network, you leave internet. If you are within Facebook, within Twitter, uh, or X now, uh, within uh, YouTube, you are not in internet anymore. You are within a private place built on internet. And I feel that there is a certain level of confusion in this conversation this morning. Because uh, we, we, we use internet to speak about TCP IP and to speak about uh, Facebook or Twitter or, or TikTok or whatever you want. And just to mention it, as a European citizen, I prefer the European rules than Elon Musk rules. And I prefer to, to discuss with other countries and other citizens and to decide something and to impose this decision to these big platforms. And I, I want to add this because if we don't put this in the conversation, and we can still protect the free and open and decentralized extra internet. That's, uh, but people don't live. My, my daughters, they are never on a blog, for example, or on internet. They are always within something. Thank you very much. Uh, Chital and then Izumi. Okay, here we go. Um, so there was a lot there to react to. I, um, I said earlier that I think we know what we need to do um, and we're not doing it. And perhaps to, to elaborate a bit on that, um, what I would say is that you know, on the legal fragmentation point and the fact that there is a need for harmonization of, of frameworks, we do have uh, international human rights law and standards and of course there is a lack of agreement perhaps um, around um, around how that is being effectively inst uh, implemented but it is there we have the rule of law we have our institutions and we need to um, use what we have which is includes interpretations of international human rights law for the digital age um, that, that already exist and we need to commit to those. And I think global norms and standards, which include those that are discussed here at the IGF um, and are evolving, including in various um, UN um, institutions, um, it requires re referring to and again, committing to constantly and adapting those um, to, to the digital age. Because ultimately I think what, that's what we have to build on, and we have to build on that. Um, so there are a couple of areas, and I, I know we're going to come to the question of what do we do, um, but I just wanted to, to highlight that protecting what is essentially the openness, the ability to um, get online, to perhaps build new um, apps or technologies, um, and shape the future, I think is is so key, and we have the critical properties of the internet that we'll have discussed. We have um, 
they need to we understand they need to protect that. We understand they need to align and to harmonize our um, uh, stand, um, our legal frameworks to to human rights standards. We know that we need to make these bodies more inclusive, and there are ways to do that. And I think that what's really important is that we we refer to these commitments, um, and that we are all. Uh, taking that home as well and working on ensuring in, in various democratic institutions um, and in global forums that we are uh, vocalizing these values um, and, and ensuring that there are mechanisms for implementing and instituting them. And just, I mean, perhaps I can say this at the end, but I'll quickly just throw it in here. I think, I know that we don't have many people in their teens and, um, and perhaps younger people here but I think it's important for us, perhaps the older people, to be um, to not be nostalgic about the world that wasn't that perhaps not you know per isn't that great um, or wasn't that great either, and to to look forward to building a world that is um, ultimately about you know about liberation and about ensuring human rights are protected, and that when it comes to the internet, I think is what is really key is ensuring user control. So ensuring that the kind of control that has just been discussed about corporate actors or governments controlling and deciding um, what the internet is, that doesn't happen. So we need to rest that back. And how we do that, I know we're having that conversation. I said we already have many, um, many ideas and, and ways to do that. But that's key because it's that um, that's shifting and that's what people are worried about. And that's when I was a child, I remember thinking it was so cool that I could just get online and I knew, it was transparent, knew how to, you know, where um, information was and, and um, now I think what is happening is that the journey is becoming more intransparent. We don't know why certain things are happening and that needs to shift. Thank you very much. Izumi? Thank you. Um, being a little bit older than you, I'd like to go say 70% of what you said. When I was 40, I was really excited to see all the new things online and stuff. But to respond to maybe the Victorious and Bertrand's um, questions come comments, I'd like to respond to these. Uh, it's, yes, it's the people's will, as Vittorio said, or the, you, the jurisdiction, legal framework, et cetera, or international politics. I'd like to add a little more. If you think that we are in, now, in 19, uh, 2043, at the World, let's say, Conference or Governance Forum, World Governance Forum, not the Internet Forum, or Internet Governance Forum, uh, with the new United Nations and the new United Communities, in 20 years from now. It could happen, right? After whichever will win at that war or this war. Um, so, and then coming the war is the climate change war. Uh, there might be a regulation that there won't, shouldn't be too many servers at the data center, not too many AIs or crypto or these. These are environmental factors. You may think it's external factors to the internet, but I would suggest you to make it upside down. Back to the history, in the 40s, we had fought a lot. They killed each other a lot. With a reflection coming, the, some of the use of the information, and then the ballistic calculators sending bombs, and then coming the internet during the Cold War days. But then in the 80s to the 90s, the world has changed. The Cold War is over. We hoped that East and West come closer. That's why the Eastern side wanted to be united using the internet, perhaps. The China wanted to have technology and science and econ economic growth. That's why they accepted the internet. We tried hard to co talk with them. So these wills of the people, entities, allowed some technology to be picked up and made global. How about now? China reached there. India reached there, and do they need real, you know, globally united and science sources from the West? Yes and no, right? So the, my uh, first take of the mixture of the fragmented one as well as some, you know, chaotic one, we all need both, but we don't know what's the reality of the politics and the environmental changes and stuff like that in the near future, not to mention the far. So I think we should go out of the box, uh, go out of the ivory tower or IP tower, internet-centric thing, and the future of the internet, who cares? The future of us, we care. So then how 
technologies, including the current and the future internet that you guys, we guys will work, may make something better. That's kind of my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lorraine. Thank you. And I think that's a perfect segue to, to my point as well. Um, um, I completely agree with Izumi. And I think, oh, I, I do. And I think it's, uh, uh, I mean, we can think about the sort of golden age of the internet and where it was um, a lot of um, sort of personal blogs and websites and, and all of that. And I think the, the, and of course it wasn't just that, but I'm, I'm just trying to think about the average person who ultimately doesn't care about that and what they want is to be able to access content. And, and sometimes I think that we create, I mean, narratives really matter here and the words that we're using really matter. And I think that's a common thread in this discussion. We're talking about the internet and we're talking about fragmentation. So I think questioning those terms also comes into play. It's important. Uh, and so ultimately I don't think it's about the internet uh, in itself. It is about a digital society, right? And as Izumi was saying, because I mean, uh, I do think that we need to think about what we want as a society first. And as Shita was saying, what, what does the, do the people, people want the internet to feel like or their lives to be on the internet? And I feel we actually don't have the answer very clearly for that yet. And that's why we're struggling. Because if we do know, we are then not just uh, creating uh, those big enemies out of uh, um, entities that are not entirely bad, uh, certainly not entirely good, but not entirely bad because they offer services that, it, that, it, that are useful. Um, and at the same time, I think that we then focus on what are the harms and what are the policy objectives that we are trying to achieve. If the issue is with walled gardens, there are tools that we can use and competition tools to, 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 to use to address that if the issue is around uh, com a competition. Uh, it, we, we can look into portability and interoperability as tools that have been used in different markets, uh, in telecoms, for example, on the right of user to actually move from one platform to the other. That's not possible right now. And if we see this, if we identify as a society that that's an, that's an issue, we need to try to find a remedy regulatory and legal uh, to address that. The thing with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with uh, the internet is that it's not one government that can do it by itself. And so the question comes back to the point that Izumi made and to the point that Bethel made. It's about governance. It's about how we cooperate in the international setting. And so for me, instead of uh, using 75% or 18 workshops of the IGF to talk about AI, mostly very sort of uh, in a high level, uh, I would rather that we use that time to talk about how do we cooperate and how do we govern uh, this complex adaptive system that is it's really difficult to address uh, and how do we actually identify what are our objectives, economic and social, and what are the best remedies to, to get there. Thank you very much and that tees up the final part of our conversation today, which is how do we get there? But Olaf, um, unfortunately, you're the last to go, and there are several questions that have not been addressed by the panel so far. Uh, uh, Web3 money, incentives, global south geopolitical um, aspects, <laughs> digital colonialization, <laughs> counter-narratives, um, and uh, uh, capacities and legislative frameworks. We've talked a bit about that. Well, but, or anything you like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, the, my first re response would be Stack Overflow, but that might be a little bit... <laughs> I DDoSed you. You DDoSed your brain. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I had indeed uh, made a bunch of, of, of notes, and I, I actually don't know how to start, where to start. Um, but let me start with not having infrastructure at all is the ultimate fragmentation. Not having it at all is the ultimate fragmentation. And I... I so associate with Joel, empower communities. Uh, what we do at the Internet Society is, is, is empower communities by building IXPs, by uh, giving cookbooks for building community networks. And that's not the only way. I know that Joel is working on his own stuff and, and is very smart about it. Um, but that's, that's really uh, empowering. and. In the end, that's bottom-up. Um, other parts. 
we talked a lot about economics and government rules. And when you talk about economics and standardization, I think we have to be honest. Uh, 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 standardization is also, also, to a large extent, industry politics. The standardization body you choose to do your work has to do with industry politics. Um, and we need to put that on the table and understand it. Um, economics, of course, consolidation happens. Even if you have open technologies, companies will try to extract money out of the deploying that open technology. Consolidation happens. And with that, you have you know, a, a accumulation of power to a point where uh, you know, uh, uh, Henri may say this is too much, or Henri's government might say this is too much. Um, and I, 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 I associate with that to a, to a large degree. Um, what I was also thinking is when we talked about standards, you don't need standards for every innovation. And uh, the name Satoshi Na uh, Nakamoto came, came up, and uh, I hope you all know who that was. Yes, blockchain inventor. And that's permissionless in innovation that has changed the world. For the good, for the bad, I don't, I, I don't, I have a sort of opinion about that. But um, th this is somebody who wrote a paper, published the paper online for everybody to read. That's open innovation, and it happens all the day. We're in this room, but on the internet, people are sharing code fragments and open building blocks all the time. Innovation happens today. And it doesn't happen only in standards organization. No, it happens by individuals in sheds, it happens in companies, it happens everywhere. If you ask me where you want to go with this internet in the future from a sort of technical perspective, then I would say open, open, and open. Open architecture, so people build against pieces of others, open source, so people can reuse those building blocks, and open standards. And with a lot of transparency around that, and I think that the building blocks of, the of a positive future uh, 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 have, uh, are, are basically open. Um, I think that Thank was my, I, my, I drained my stack. That's right. brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, we've just, no. <laughs> that doesn't often happen as a panel, does it? A round of applause. Thank you very much. Well, we've got a little bit of time left. Um, and normally by the time we unpack all of the problems, we've run out of time. I've got a question from the audience, and then I'm going to introduce... Uh, our latest speaker, Raoul. I'm not going to make him summarize the conversation so far. <laughs> what I'm going to do is to start with you, Raoul, to, to think about the how, not about the what, not about all the problems, we've rehearsed that, not about the different visions, but how do we get to a better place, to the 20 years time where we've sussed it all out, what do we need to do? How do we get there? So, first of all, thank you very much for your patience, uh, wait, um, and, and thank you for your question. Hi, I'm, I'm Yog Desai. I'm an Internet Society Youth Ambassador. Um, I am probably too young to be conservative, but I, ha I have my doubts on how much Internet can fundamentally change. But my fear is that with the pace of innovation and these bunch of emerging technologies coming in, we'll have applications built on the base of the internet, and it will get really complex to the extent that we won't have enough expertise, understanding, and knowledge to make sure that all these different parts work together. One of the panelists mentioned complex adaptive systems. I'm not sure how we are going to adapt to this. So 20 years from now, uh, I think we will have fragmentation not by design, but by default, because we just don't know how things work. Um, and standardization is being mentioned quite a lot, and that is possibly one of the solutions. But standardization is also an extremely slow process. And uh, with this pace of innovation, uh, I am not sure standardization can keep up. Also, the interests that go into standardization, as Olaf was mentioning, it's, it's largely industry-driven. So I want to press the panel and the audience to think on 
how we can include more stakeholders, especially the users, in, in standardization process and make it accessible to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that's a good how uh, question as well. How do we make our processes more inclusive? But I, I think let's, let's run through the panel. Let's start with you, Raul. Thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the panel, uh, Raul Echeberria. Um, how do we get to, what do we need to do to get to that brighter future uh, that, that we've articulated? Thank you very much. I, I, I'm sorry for the delay in joining. I feel like an imposter here because uh, <laughs> I was uh, in another session now. Uh, I'm running to, to get here. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the answer. That's the, that's the first point. That the, if I would have that answer, probably I would get a good, um, uh, a good position, a good job here in, the, in one of the companies that, uh, or governments or, institutional, or institutions that. But, uh, and, so uh, just, we can just reflect and think about that. And uh, as uh, you described it in the, in, the, in the possible scenarios, I think that we already, we, we already have certain level of uh, fragmentation in, in, in internet, and we have to live with that. And the, so I don't think that is a feasible scenario where the, the, that's, we have that ideal internet and perfect internet that, uh, that all of us uh, want to have. The, the theory of the rational human that uh, people act according to the rationality and so the, what is uh, best for everybody is something that died in the 80s. And so the incentive of policymakers are, are diverse. Um, many times even knowing that the decisions that are being taken are not the best one for, uh, for the, uh, the, the, the for one objective, like uh, keep the, the internet not fragmented, so the, many times the decisions will go in a, in a different direction. So what o our mission is to keep the internet as less fragmented as possible. As possible. The, so if there was one thing, one thing, I do. think that's uh, I, I would say that's uh, two things. Uh, one <laughs> is that is that we need to uh, to have uh, gradual objectives and commitments. <coughs> Uh, instead of for going for the whole uh, packet, just let's uh, try to get uh, uh, agreements on, on simple things and try to gradually improve that. And, and we have to really is, uh, make our messages much more simple. I, I heard uh, Olaf today in a, in a, in a session uh, before this, uh, this morning, earlier this morning, and uh, he was excellent too in that session. <laughs> so it's, uh, is, uh, is usual on him, but but I thought uh, when I was listening to him saying, if I have to explain this to policymakers in Latin America, I have to bring Olaf with me. So the, uh, this is very is very complex. Uh, so we need to make our our messages much more simple about what the government should not do, what the the the, the, the policies should not uh, uh, in, uh, as produce, and uh, so to to give them. Uh, more uh, tangible tools uh, for taking uh, better decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olaf. Um, no. oh, thank you, sorry, Olaf, you. Thank you, uh, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Raoul. <laughs> sorry, just like my brain went. Uh, I was thinking, do I include Mark now? Do I go back to the panel? Um, Mark, do you have a sure. quick point, or do you want to? Can we continue with the? Let's hear two more from the panel. Come back to you. Um, so, uh, Lorraine, and then. Uh, Ambassador Verdier. Okay, so what do we do, right? What we're going to do, let's be action oriented, let's action -oriented. keep focused on that. Okay. It, even it's just one thing. So from Raoul, we had just an incremental approach. Try to do small things well, you know, yeah. So, so maybe we do that game where we just add on to what the other said. Uh, so incremental, um, I mean, being clear on the objectives is the first, being incremental is another. And being iterative, I think, uh, is, is important as well. And I think uh, a lot of the issues with the processes that are being built uh, to address the challenges that we have, there are many, is that we are under the impression that it suffice for us to uh, design and develop the ultimate regulation, and that's going to solve all of our problems. Uh, and 
And there's a, a whole lot of questions that get unanswered once you do that, because one, we are, the fact that we are in a complex depth of system means that it's very hard for us to predict it, uh, because the system moves in a way where one just one element in that system can have really implications on, on, on the whole in ways that it's very hard to predict. Uh, so what we do with those systems is that we observe and we try to adapt to it. And in order to do that, we need to be able to have the processes and the institutions that are much more agile than the ones that we have now. So instead of looking to linear approaches of developing regulation, we need to th think of it like almost like software development where we have versioning of policies and regulation where we're able to actually identify a bug and then be able to correct it by yeah. m having inclusive multi-stakeholder consultations. And the problem is that, uh, and, and that's an, uh, 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 an issue that I was trying to unpack with Bertrand the other day, uh, and it was the fact on how we think about multi-stakeholderism is that it's, uh, it's trying to get away from government's decision-making power so that everyone's deciding in a sort of a global happy assembly, right? And that's not what multi-stakeholderism is supposed to be. Uh, and certainly it's not what it's uh, sometimes and often applied by government, which is, oh, I'll give you 30 days for you to uh, uh, participate in this consultation, and I, I've done a multi-stakeholder process. That's not it either. It's actually being intentional about including people people uh, and, and different stakeholders, iterative inclusive, iterative, uh, in a way that is actually particularly not only national levels, in the international level, that we are including the global south, youth, different uh, uh, communities that are underrepresented uh, uh, as well, and, and the, in the way that is actually intentional and looking towards a process that it's not simply aiming to produce the ultimate legal text to rule them all, yeah. but it's actually a process what we're trying to learn and we are assuming uh, our just uh, inability to predict uh, uh, accurately the future and the fact that we are adapting uh, uh, along the way and Thank trying you. to be better at it. And we do not have the processes and we do not have the institutions. One of the things that we are doing in building is sandboxes as a, as a, uh, a possible avenue to testing out uh, those issues that we don't know about. Uh, and a lot more needs to be shared on how how they best work, how they don't work. We almost yeah. need to do a sandbox out of sandboxes in itself, yeah. uh, but I, I won't so, get into yeah, details So a, sort of a playful approach, an iterative approach, building on uh, where we started with Raul about incremental approaches, m simpler messaging, and this sort of sense of agility. Ambassador Verdier. So I don't know what we have to do, but maybe we could agree on a compass. Uh, I was surprised w when you did mention the nostalgia for the golden age, because usually I'm not a kind of no nostalgic ga guy. <laughs> but I think that we, we should stand for at least three aspects of this golden age. The first one is uh, the unprecedented openness of access to information, knowledge, and culture. This was a big shift, and this is not finished. We still have the digital divide and uh, half of the humanity that doesn't access to this. The second one was the unprecedented empowerment of communities and people. And the last one was the permissionless innovation. And from my perspective, th this could be a kind of compass um, for future decisions. Are we increasing people's autonomy and creative capacity? And that's why I did mention some concern, for example, with sometimes the private sector, because if you think in terms of autonomy, empowerment, and um, creativity, the threat can come from everywhere, not just from rogue states. Thank you, I like the idea of a compass, and that can be very good organizing. Uh, I want to come to Mark quickly, and then I've got, I was going to come to you in a bit, or are you reacting very? Yeah, yeah go ahead. If I may, with a very, uh, what I wrote down is actually what Henry said, principle-based as the add-on. Um, and I, I like the principles you, you pose. Um, the note I made was principle-based, and then there's a differentiation, I think, of the approach of the internet, of the regulator or evolution of the internet, and evolution on the internet. I think that we can get to those shared principles much easier 
if we talk about the evolution of the internet and that when we talk about empowerment, individualism, autonomy, getting a global consensus ab about that, on the internet might be where the trouble is going to be in setting joint principles as a, as a, as a guide. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to pause in our, in our final roundup uh, to just have these two questions from the audience. We've got Mark and then uh, Lucien, and, uh, and we are in the last five minutes, so thank you very much for that reminder. So, brevity. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark Deresgaard from Brazil. I'm an internet governance consultant for small and medium organizations. Um, I found comments by Lohane and Olaf to be quite stimulating in a sense that of something that I, I have been talking a lot about, which is the AI forum, as it has become now, uh, <laughs> hasn't been focusing a lot on one of the questions that I find more key about it, which is open source versus closed source. So why are we in this AI space we are in right now? Because there were very early open source developments on this that just let the technology lose. A lot of the debate goes around mid-journey and this proprietary technologies, but very pe few people are looking at things like stable diffusion, which are basically being iterated upon in, on the basis of papers, right? Just like you said, it's paper after paper, and that gets incorporated into the technology, and that's how it's expanding. And then the private companies need to port that back into their, their proprietary code. So the, this reality seems very feasible because we're watching it happen right now how open source and papers are actually starting to drive. There's no AI consortium forum or, or, or anything. It's literally being driven by, by research that's published in an open space. So this is something that we should be looking towards, not as, hey, this is about AI, but rather about, is this the new paradigm of how different protocols and, and standards and different approaches will be developed. So just thank to you. kind of complement that point, thank you very much. Yeah, and, that, and, the, and a very, um, very valuable point about the role of research in, in, in sort of acting as that sort of snowball effect. And, and I think uh, it's Lucien Taylor from the DNS Research Federation, and I think my point follows on from Mark's about protocols. I'm, I've been an in internet engineer for over 20 years with my team. Um, and I've just had the privilege of meeting Vince Cerf with, with Emily and talking to him about protocols and uh, absolutely wonderful thing. Um, what he did, I think there's a, there's a gap between the IETF, which is not frankly a safe space for women and people to develop standards, and how you develop protocols. Vince Cerf got together with a few other universities and they developed a way of doing things and that was TCPIP and they then invented the internet and then we bake it in through standards bodies like the IETF. I think standards are a very good place to test these new ideas and we are at an inflection point. We've got regulation hammering down on us and that regulation needs to be tested. Things like know your customer, putting that into a free and open internet is, is really challenging. And my question to the panel is, 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 that, is the IETF the place to develop in a free and open way those, those protocols that we need next? Thank, Thank you. you. So we've got probably less than three minutes left and three panelists I'll, and questions. I'll quick, okay, I'll quickly say that I think, Victoria, you posed some philosophical, philosophical questions earlier and I'm not going to judge what people do um, um, in terms of, you know, the, the question of what young people do and selfies and all of that. But what I am going to judge, and I think what we should all judge, is what governments do when they regulate. Um, do they align the regulation with human rights norms and standards? Do companies who also have obligations to do so do that? Are they transparent? Are they accountable? And are our um, governance forums and standards bodies inclusive? Um, no, clearly not. But there are recommendations for how to change that. The Office of the Human Rights Commissioner, OHCHR, has um, released a report with many recommendations on how to change um, and how to improve inclusiveness. And I, um, I can say that we're doing a session on Thursday where we'll be exploring that report. So um, I think protecting critical properties as they evolve, having that principles-based approach, aligning with what we have, building with um, on the human rights um, framework, and creating more inclusive spaces is really key. Thank you. Raul, and then Izumi. Yes, I endorse everything she said. Good. <laughs> but, 
but beside that, on another point, as a, a few weeks ago, I, I, I participated in a global conference of parliamentarians uh, uh, speaking about the future. But m the average age was uh, over 50. Uh, and so the, uh, all the discussion was about the fears about the future and the fears about uh, AI. And, uh, and so the, uh, the, we have to be very careful that, that uh, the policies are not developed based on fear. So I say, yeah. of course, that's it's normal that they, they have fears. I have fears. I am I'm, I'm terrified about the the the, the, it's, it's the, the future. I scare, but uh, don't don't let my fears uh, stop the, evol the evolution. That's uh, this is why we have to involve youth in the in the discussion. And probably if we bring people like 18 years old that they don't have the old expertise on architecture and internet architecture and other things to speak, but they can say how is the internet they want and they. That would help very much. In that. Thank you very much. Give the microphone to Maybe two things. our last thoughts. I saw no China nor India in the last session, I mean the main session yesterday while they are talking about AI. It's, to me, it's fragmented. The IGF wasn't like that 18 years ago. We have tensions, we have fears, we have battles. Now we are peaceful and boring. <laughs> Go out to the chaos or make the chaos, please. Fear, fine. We don't know the future. Be bold. And to the IPers and IP fundamentalists, I would say, go outside the box. Go to the World Governance Forum. Go to the climate change thing and talk with them. Learn from them. Eat their foods. Don't give, you, uh, give them the food. Okay. So otherwise, all these complex things in 20 years would happen. The internet wouldn't work in the use. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, that brings our session to an end. Thank you very much for all the interaction and to our brilliant panel. Thank you. <laughs>